Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and turn to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 16, if you would, please. Gospel of John, chapter 16. We're going to read the first seven verses of John, chapter 16. We'll read the verses responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on verse 1 and alternating until we end together on verse 7 of John, chapter 16. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, out of respect for God's word. And in verse number one, let's start together. Ready? These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Then they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, Sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, we ask you to continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, again for the wonderful spirit here in the service this evening. Thank you for the great singing that has surely been a blessing to us, Lord, and we trust a blessing to you as well. And Lord, we ask your blessing on the special now as it's brought. I pray, Lord, that we'll listen carefully and that you'll minister at our hearts through the song. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, Father, we come to the preaching of your word tonight, and we bow before you at the beginning of the message to ask your help tonight, not only, Lord, as I bring this message, but for each individual as they listen tonight. Lord, I would ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to your people tonight as only he can. Lord, we believe the Bible tonight to not just be the 
words of man or the words of men. We believe it to be the words of God. We believe it's alive. We believe it's powerful. That it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray that this evening we would receive the word tonight as you spoke it to your disciples, that we would receive it as if you're speaking these words to us. And so, Lord, help us tonight to stand on your promises. And I'll thank you for it. I pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus is talking to his disciples. Of course, he's preparing them that he's going to be going away. And they have to understand these are men that have forsaken all and followed him. For three years, a little over three years, uh, they've lived with him. They've loved him. They've worshipped him. They've admired him. They've followed him. They've prayed with him. They've listened to him. And now he says he's leaving them. And Jesus tells us sorrow has filled their hearts. He tells them that he's going to die, that he'll be buried and he'll rise again after three days, and then he's going to return to heaven. And so they're upset about it. They're sorrowful. They're discouraged. They're downcast, however you want to word it, because they want him to stay. This isn't the way they figured it was going to end. That's why when Jesus first explained his death, his suffering and his death, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? <laughs> uh, it didn't go so well for him. And they didn't understand that he came to die. And so he gives them some promises here in John 16 that we're going to look at this evening. And I want to remind you a couple things about when God promises something. I want to remind you, first of all, that God doesn't lie. In fact, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Number two, God doesn't change His mind. In other words, God doesn't go back on His promises. Uh, Numbers 23, 19, if you want to jot that verse down, it says, God is not man that He should lie, neither the Son of man that He should repent. Hath He said, and shall He not do it? Or hath He spoken, and shall He not make it good? God said it, He'll do it. The third thing I'll remind you about God's promises are He's never failed to keep one of them. Joshua said, not one thing that He's told us has ever failed to come to pass. God keeps every one of His promises and He is able to keep His promises. And a command is to be obeyed, but a promise is to be believed. And you have to believe His promises. Peter wrote, There's given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that carry us through. These promises, I believe, that Jesus gave to His disciples carried them through, and I believe they'll carry us through as well. Let's look at these promises here this evening. The first thing that Christ promised them was a comforter. Notice verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. Notice, I will send Him to you. He didn't say, I'll send it to you. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand that the Holy Spirit will be um, in us all that Jesus Christ has been to us. The Holy Spirit would be in them all that Jesus Christ had been to them. They, they have to grasp that concept. In other words, the Holy Spirit is to be as real to them, would be as real to them inwardly as Christ has been outwardly. And He's just as real to us inwardly as Christ is outwardly. Now, we're not waiting for the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8, 9. So if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Jesus Christ. But when you receive Christ your Savior, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says that our body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. So He takes up residence inside of you when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And He's the one uh, who the Bible says He guides and He teaches. He guides and He teaches us. Look at a couple of scriptures with me. Put your bookmark or something in John 16 and look over with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is in us, the third person of the Godhead, to guide us and teach us. How does He do that? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 2 and notice with me verse number 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Now oftentimes that verse is quoted as a reference to heaven or how wonderful heaven will be that I have not seen or heard what God has prepared for them to love Him. And that I won't argue with you on that, but that's really not what that verse is talking about. Notice what it says in verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us. So it says, I have not seen nor ear heard neither in the heart of man the things God prepared for us, but God has revealed those unto us. How did He do it? By His Spirit. That's right. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why did we receive the Spirit which is of God? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And that's why we see which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the natural man would be the unsaved man. Okay? One who does not have the Spirit of God. He receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because he's spiritually discerned. He's spiritually unable to understand it. You know, somebody said, I just don't understand the Bible. Well, that, those words ought not to come from a Christian. Because you have the one who inspired the Bible living inside of you. And, and so you can communicate with the author to understand what the Bible says. I understand the, uh, the email I got today, and I think Brother Dean may have seen it too, about a fellow complaining, and I don't know if somebody went out visiting today or knocking on doors or whatever, but he said, Sunday's supposed to be a day of rest, then why are you people bothering me uh, on Sunday? And uh, I don't know what that was all about, but uh, the, the truth is, it's, 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 Sunday isn't the Sabbath. I'll reply to that later maybe, but... Um, you don't. It doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense why you go to church Sunday. Some people, even lost people, may let you go to church Sunday morning. They have no idea why you would want to go back on Sunday night, and certainly no idea what you're doing there Wednesday night. Uh, that's just that's just boggling to them, and they don't understand that because they're spiritually discerned. They're kind of spiritually disabled. The 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 connection to be able to understand that isn't there, and and so it's the Spirit of God that teaches us the Word of God. Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Go to the next Corinthians, right after 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter 3 with me, please. Now, the Bible says here in verse 17, Now, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Rolling the glass, look, the glass there is the, a reference to the Bible. And we're holding is looking into like an image, like you look into a mirror. But what we're looking into here, we don't see our image. When you open the Bible and look in it, whose image do you see? Jesus Christ's image. And God says what you do is the longer you look and the longer you be in God's Word, God begins to change our image into this image. How does He do that? Look what it says. From the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as you read the Bible and you study the Bible and you memorize the Bible and you meditate in the Bible, the Spirit of God begins to do some work on you. And He begins to change you. And that change comes from the inside out. 
And he puts you and he conforms you to the image of Jesus Christ. If you're not changing, if you're not conforming, if you're not becoming more like Christ, I'll guarantee you, you're not spending much time in God's Word. This will, this, it, it's alive. It'll transform you. You, can, you won't be able to help it. Uh, you just have to be diligent to study, to show yourself approved unto God. And the Spirit of God works effectually in us just as Christ worked effectually for us when He died on the cross. So Christ did His work for us, but the Holy Spirit does His work in us. He guides us and He teaches us, and then we follow His teaching. We follow His instruction. We follow what He teaches us. So, listen, if that's how the Holy Spirit works, and the Holy Spirit gave us, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So He gave the Word of God. He's not going to lead us contrary to God's Word. Don't, don't say, well, I prayed about it. This is what God wants me to do. And, and, and that's okay as long as it lines up with God's Word. If it's contrary to God's Word, God's Word, that's not the Spirit of God leading you. He'll lead you in exact accordance with His Word. He might, he's not going to contradict the Word that He gave from God. All right. So He gives them. He says, hey, the first promise is the Holy Spirit. And you and I have that. We get it automatically when you receive Christ as your Savior. And He indwells every one of us. Don't neglect the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't just read the Bible and never ask Him for help. Before you ever open the book and before you sit down and begin to read the Bible, you ought to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and open your understanding so you can comprehend the truth that He has for you as you open up His Word. Okay? The first promise is the promise of the Comforter. And, and by the way, don't, this, this rules out the excuse, I'm not comfortable doing that. How many times are, oh, you need to you know, come to church and you read your Bible, well, I'm not comfortable doing that. Well, you know what? Nothing about change is very comfortable. Okay? It, um, tailors are... Uh, houses, uh, if you didn't, we're in Sunday school today. Their house is in under contract. And uh, it looks like if everything goes the way uh, it should, by the, about the 20-something of April, they'll be traveling down to Georgia. They've, they're, they're changing where they live. How comfortable has that been? <laughs> Not real comfortable, is it? <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of late nights and early mornings and changing things and moving things and fixing things, and it's not comfortable. Why? Change isn't comfortable. But, you know, listen, so what do we do when we're not comfortable? God says, I gave you a comforter. I gave you a comforter to help you. And the comforter is the Holy Spirit of God. Don't ignore him. Don't ignore the comforter. That's the promise that Jesus promised. The second promise he gives them is down in verse number 22. John 16, verse 22. Will you look there with me, please? Notice what he tells them. And now, therefore, and ye now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So his promise, his second promise is he's returning. He's returning. Now, he did see him again at his resurrection, of course. He appeared in the upper room, remember, and Thomas wasn't there, and then later on, and he, he actually spent um, 40 days with them until he ascended back to heaven, 10 days before Pentecost. But I think it's a greater promise he has in mind here. I think it's the promise of John 14, 3, where he, said, he tells him, in fact, you're, you're close there. Just turn back a page or two to your left. In my Bible, it's just one page. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'd go to prayer place for you. And if I go and prayer place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I think that's the promise Jesus was referring to. I think he's saying, I'm going to come again, and this time I'm coming to receive you to myself. That's what... Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he said that the, the, dead, and, the, that the uh, dead in Christ are going to rise first and 
they're going to hear the voice, of the, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall ever be with the Lord. And then he ends that by saying, comfort one another with these words. Hey, encourage each other with those words. Jesus is coming again. What a great promise. I don't know when He's coming. I know I've been in church for all of my life. I've been that, that I can remember. You know, I can go back 54, 55 years where I remember being in church and I remember hearing sermons about Jesus coming again. And you say, well, He still hasn't come. I know. But I know this. We're, we're, we're closer today than we were yesterday. It's got to be coming close. And I know that every, every day we live, every hour we live, we're just an hour closer to Him keeping that promise. God doesn't lie. God keeps His promises. And Jesus is coming again. Dr. J.C. Massey told how a young, as a young man, he was persuaded to attend, to attend the theater much against his own will. After being seated, however, he got up quickly. What are you doing? asked his friends. He said, I'm getting up. Well, where are you going? they urged. I'm going out. Well, wait, you, we just came in. He says, I know it, but I'm going out. Dr. Massey said, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus could come to the, back to this earth and He may come at any time. And I don't want Him to find me here. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? Not to, if, if he came back on Sunday night, I'd want to be right here. If he came back on Wednesday night, I'd want to be right here. I want to be uh, doing what he's called me to do. I'd hate to be in a place where I'd be embarrassed to be found. Jesus is coming again. We don't, we don't hear that. We don't dwell on that promise like we ought to. It ought to be an encouragement to us. That maybe today, I don't do that like I ought to. I've heard of different men who every morning they wake up and they look out the window and say, well, maybe today. And every night before they go to bed, they say, well, Lord, maybe tomorrow. They're always thinking about the return of Christ. That, that ought to be more of a, you know, the Bible says, unto them that look for Him will He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I wonder how many of us are looking for Him. Really are aware and it's on the forefront of our mind and we, or do we just get caught up in life and we forget that this is only a short time. Jesus is coming again. The songwriter said, Oh, I want to see Him. Look upon His face. There to sing forever of His saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Listen, you don't, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad about people who die and go to heaven. They're, 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 they're far better off than we are. And don't cry for them to come back. They wouldn't come back if you offered them everything in the world. They're, with, they're in a great place. And Jesus is coming to get us all one day. Amen? So He gives them the promise of the Comforter. He gives them the promise of His return. Notice again in uh, chapter 16 and verse number 23. Here's another promise He gives them. <clears throat> and in that day, ye shall ask Me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in My name, He will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in My name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. You know what He gives them here? Answers to prayer. Answered prayer. He said prayer is a promise. You promise you that I'll go away, but you can stay in touch. You don't need a cell phone. You don't need minutes. You don't have to worry about any satellite coverage. He am available any time, day or night. Amen? And He says, if I ask anything in His name, He'll give it to me. And that's, that simply means, whatever I ask for, I know Jesus would sign His name to it and say, that's okay, that's what I want too. It doesn't mean that I can ask whatever I want. Well, Lord, uh, send me the million in small bills. And the brand new, you know, uh, car that I want, and uh, and I ask it in Jesus' name. No, you're forging Jesus' name on that request. That's not what he would sign for. 
And so, you know, this is what he would put his name on. This is what Jesus would put his approval to and sign his name to it. Now, we can know. We don't pray. The reason, the Bible says the reason oftentimes we don't get our prayers answered is because we pray or we ask amiss to consume it on our lusts, on our own desires. We're just telling God our grocery list what we want and just because we don't know if it's what his will is or not. But look at Romans chapter 8 with me, would you please? Romans chapter 8. Great chapter. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse number 26. Romans 8 and verse 26, where the Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Well, what, what's one of our infirmities? We know not what we should pray for as we ought. You ever, you ever been kind of uncertain about how you should pray? Should I ask for this? Should I ask for this? How should, Lord, I don't know how I should pray for this. Well, that's where we have the prayer partner, the Holy Spirit. It says, The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he'll make intercession for us because he knows what God wants. So I need to ask the Spirit of God, what does God want in this matter? How does God want me to pray about this? And then pause and wait for the Spirit of God to impress upon your heart how you should pray. And then you'll know how to pray. And you know you're praying. 1 John 5 tells us if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if He hears us, we know we get the petitions that we ask of Him. That's a great promise of prayer. Great promise that though I won't be here physically for you guys to look at me, fellas, you can pray and you can have the Spirit of God, that comforter I told you about, He's going to help you know what the mind of God is on the matter and you can pray and you ask and, and he'll, he'll make sure that it's something I would put my name to it and you'll receive it. You'll get it. Take care of you. He desires, God, God desires to bless us. God desires to answer our prayer. God desires to have us uh, uh, talk to Him and have a relationship with Him in prayer. J. Sidlow Baxter said, Men may spurn our appeals, may reject our message, may oppose our arguments, may despise our persons, but they're helpless against our prayers. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless peace pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Prayer. So he gives the promise of the comforter, the promise of his return, the promise of prayer. Then look with me in John 16 and notice with me verse number 33. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He said, I've spoken these things, that in me ye might have peace. Peace. Peace is not in circumstances. Peace is not in the situation. Peace is not in your environment. Peace is not in riches or wealth or position. Peace is in a person. The person of Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. When He was born, the angel said, On earth, peace. Goodwill toward men. Not peace on earth. On earth, peace. Why? Peace was Jesus. He's on earth now. And the earth, the peace is in a person. We don't get peace, nor do we create peace. Peace is a person. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Be full of care. The word we would use would be anxious, probably. Anxiety. It says, I get, I get anxiety attacks. I just get full of anxiety. The Bible says, be anxious or be careful for nothing. Well, how is that possible? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. 
Then what's verse 7 say? And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There He is, the Prince of Peace. That will keep Him in perfect peace, Isaiah 26.3, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You have to keep your mind stayed on Jesus Christ. That's the peace of God that passes all understanding. The people shake their head and can't figure out how you can have peace. The kind of peace that, that, that Charles Spafford wrote about when he wrote that song, it is well with my soul, having just lost his four children when the ship went down and wrecked. You see, how can that be? How can, how can he have peace with it when, when that just happened? When sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. That's peace. And, and I'm sure the, 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 the world would look at that and don't understand that. How can you have peace in the midst of all the, all the chaos and all the turmoil and all the things going on around you and yet you're calm and you have a peace inside of you? What is that all about? Well, because I have Jesus Christ inside of me. He lives within my heart. And He gives me peace and I cast all my care upon Him for He cares for me. Jesus promised us peace. Freedom from anxiety. Receiving the peace of God. So he promises them peace. Then lastly, let's look at this. Also in verse 33. Here's the fifth promise. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Isn't that good news? I like this. He promises victory. Oh, he didn't say you won't have trouble. Notice what he said, in the world ye shall have what? Tribulation. What's tribulation? Yeah, troubles. Trouble. Outside pressure. Don't, don't think you're going to live your life without some pressure. You're going to have pressure. The world, when we're not conformed to the world, remember that word means to be pressed into its mold. The world is constantly putting pressure on the believer to be like them. And God says, you're going to feel that pressure, but I want you to be of good cheer. You're on the winning side. There is victory in Jesus, like we sang about. That isn't just a song to sing. That's a way to live your life. Victory in Jesus. I have overcome them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and, and verse number 57. The Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, oh, we, we quote being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, but that comes after therefore. What's therefore, therefore? <laughs> because of victory in Jesus. Because we have the victory, we can be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we're on the winning side. Jesus has promised us victory. Victory over worry. Victory over discouragement. Victory over stubborn habits and addictions. Victory over sin. Victory. One man wrote, I was walking through a park and I passed a massive oak tree. A vine had grown up along its trunk. The vine started small, nothing to bother about. But over the years, the vine got taller and taller. And by the time I passed the tree, the entire lower half of the tree was covered by the vine's creepers. The mass of tiny feelers was so thick that the tree looked as though it had innumerable bird's nest in it. The tree was in danger. The huge solid oak was literally being taken over. Life was being squeezed from it. But the gardeners in the park had seen the danger. They took a saw and they severed the trunk of the vine. One neat cut right across the middle. Now the tangled mass of vines, the vine's branches still clung to the oak. But the vine was now dead. 
that would gradually become plain as the weeks passed by and the creepers would begin to die and fall away from the tree. And he made this comparison. He said, how easy is it for sin, which begins so small and seemingly insignificant, to grow and still it has a strangling grip on our lives. And yet Christ, death on the cross for us, cut the power of sin. It cut the vine. Oh, the creepers may still hang on us for a while. But if we'll trust in the Lord and we'll, we'll, we'll rely on His power, gradually their grip dries up and falls away. He's come that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us so. What are His promises? The Comforter. That He'll return for us. That we have prayer, we can talk to Him, we have the peace that passes all understanding, and we have victory through Him. What great promises. What great promises. You know, we sang victory in Jesus tonight. Eugene Monroe Bartlett Sr. He's considered one of the founding fathers of Southern Gospel music. He was born Christmas Eve in 1885 near Waynesville, Missouri. He relocated to Sebastian County, Arkansas with his parents. He dedicated his life to Christ at a very early age. Attended college in Tennessee and also in Missouri. He lived in the South and Bartlett enjoyed a reputation as a fine music teacher. Based in Arkansas, he traveled the entire southern portion of the country holding singing schools for anyone interested. These and similar schools trained aspiring musicians in vocal technique, sight reading, and conducting. And they were influential in the development of church music as a whole for much of the remainder of the century. He met and married Joan Tatum in 1917. They had two sons. One of them, Gene Bartlett Jr., became a nationally known writer of church music. And Charles Bartlett became a minister of music at a church in Texas. Bartlett Sr. was a very successful businessman. And he invested his money in, in a company he founded called the Hartford Music Company, Hartford, Arkansas, in 1918. Within the first year of business, he sold more than 15,000 copies of his hymn book. Many writers, singers, and musicians received their first opportunity for gospel music at the Hartford Music Company, including Albert Brumley, who wrote, All Fly Away. His mission was to publish hymns and teach singers to sight read. He hired instructors to teach voice, piano, piano tuning, harmony, and stringed instruments. He edited a music magazine called Herald of Song. He was an avid composer of hymns and gospel songs. But almost all of his songs have sunk into oblivion except one called Victory in Jesus. It's one of the most popular and widely known songs of the church. In 1939, a stroke rendered Bartlett partially paralyzed and unable to perform or travel. He spent the last two years of his life bedridden. And amid such bleak circumstances, he wrote his final and most beloved song, Victory in Jesus. An optimistic number that has been sung by millions in church services and recorded by many of gospel singers' biggest names. The three verses enthusiastically tell of one's own personal salvation experience from beginning to end. Two years after his stroke, Bartlett died January 25, 1941. Through his 56 years of life, he composed more than 800 songs. But since the early 1960s, victory in Jesus has become popular among evangelical congregations. Many hymnals have included it in their published pages. We sang it tonight. Victory in Jesus. Written by a man 
who after suffering a stroke was bedridden for two years. Hmm. Another song we sing is Standing on the Promises. And by the way, I'd, I had no idea Victory in Jesus just really became, first of all, it was written in the 1900s and I didn't know that it just became popular like in the 60s. Russell Kelso Carter was a star athlete of the military academy and an excellent student academically. He went on to be a successful teacher and coach. He spent several years as an ordained minister. After that, he went to medical school. But he was also a musician and a songwriter. In 1886, he co-edited a hymn book which included his most famous hymn. Standing on the Promises was written while he was serving as a professor of chemistry and mathematics at the Pennsylvania Military Academy. The music, composed by Carter as well, has a kind of bright marching style that must have been familiar at the academy. Though Carter was a professed Christian most of his life, it wasn't until a crisis with his natural heart that he began to understand the reality and power of Bible promises. At age 30, his health was in critical condition and the physicians said they could do no more for him. Carter turned to God for help and healing. He knelt and made a promise that healing or not, his life was finally and forever fully consecrated to the Lord's service. It was from that moment that the written Word of God became alive to Carter. Over the course of the next several months, his strength returned his heart was completely healed and he lived another 49 years. Life storms may threaten to sweep us away at times but when we choose to stand on the promises of God, we find a place of safety. A place where the footing is always firm. With confidence, we say the word of our God is forever. To believe it and obey it, it anchors our life to the rock of ages. And we can't be moved. It's a great place to stand. Standing on the promises of God. What number is that in our hymn books? Anybody know? I'll take that as a no. What is it, 300 something? Where's Bob Reed when I need him? There he is. 323, why don't we sing that? Let's sing a stanza of that, all right? Standing on the promises. You got it there? Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring A glory in the highest I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God hey you can't sing that sitting down we better stand up how do you think standing on the promises sitting down? You can't do that. What's verse 2? How does that start? Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When <clears throat> storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Sing it now. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Father, we ask that you'd help us to do just what we sang. Thank you for your wonderful promises. Oh, we just touched on five that you gave your disciples before you left. There's so many promises in Your Word. Lord, I pray that we would not stand on our emotions or our feelings. We would not stand on our thoughts. We would not stand on our heart. 
we would stand on your promises. Regardless of our situation, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our feelings, help us to stand on the promises of God. Thank you for the exceeding great and precious promises. Help us to believe them. Help us to stand firmly upon them to protect us and to give us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord.